Well, good morning. How are y'all doing? I think they're going to be moving furniture, so stand by. I want to welcome all of our campuses and uh, our online community, people who are going to get this by podcast. You're going to get this on YouTube, all the ways, all of you, of course, in front of me here in the Parkway Worship Center, the Vieira Campus, the Coco Campus, the Chapel, a.k.a. Avenue Worship Center. Come on, put your hands together for a church, one church, multiple locations. I am Pastor Brian. I get the honor of sharing the word with you today. But before I do that, I want to I want to just honor a team of people. You know, for, I don't know, it's been two or three years, actually, Pastor Matt has been talking about wanting to put a weekly service in our local jail here, the Bavar County Jail. And so it's, it's been a thing that it's taken a process, it's taken some work, of course, with COVID and all the restrictions of going in and out of the jail, there's processing, there's background checks, there's all the things. But I want to celebrate something with you. I think we have a picture of some folks. We actually prayed over these folks last night in our Saturday night service. This is a group of people. I think there's one more uh, picture there that we're gonna show. Last night we prayed over these folks. That's uh, five volunteers. There's actually about eight of them that are gonna go in weekly on Sunday afternoon starting today and have a weekly service in our jail. Come on, put your hands together for them. They're gonna preach the gospel. They're gonna set the captives free. Come on, in Jesus' name, lives transformed. And I'm thankful that scripture says, hey, Jesus actually uh, was was talking to some folks at one point in in the New Testament and said, you know, the people were like, when did we ever visit you? When did, we, when did you, we feed you when you were hungry or clothe you when you're naked or visit you when you were in prison? And Jesus said, what you did to the least of these, you've done to me. And so they're literally going to go into the jail as if they were going in to meet with Jesus in there. And they're going to go serve him and honor him and love him. Would you pray with me real quick? I want to pray over that team. Then I'm going to pray over our message. We're going to get right into it. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to not just be in locations, physical locations across our community, but we get to go into a jail and present the truth of the gospel, that regardless of our story, our situation, or what we've done right or wrong, you sent your best for us, Jesus, and we're thankful for that today. God, thank you for for transformed lives in that prison, in the jail. God, thank you for this team. Thank you for anointing them, equipping them, making them able to do far more than they ever expected or even thought they were able to do, that forever lives would be changed and never have to go back, never have to think back about what they used to be, but God, that they get freedom in knowing who they are in Christ and they'd be forever changed by their families too. In Jesus' name, could you say amen? Amen. Amen. So we're in this, uh, we've been in this season. We, like Pastor Matt said last week, we often have message series, which go three or four or five weeks. This one's been about eight weeks. We've called it a season of seeking and finding. That we've asked you to get into your Bible, to get a physical Bible, to get a paper Bible, get into it. If that would be best for you, get into that. Get the distractions away and let's dig in and seek God. And so uh, we're doing that together. I want to I wanna share a verse with you as we do that. There's a verse in Psalm 119 that says, uh, verse 162 in the New Living, it says, I rejoice in your word like one who discovers great treasure. How many of y'all know there's great treasure to be found in the Bible? We find not only stories, but we find nuggets of truth, wisdom, so much understanding, so much freedom, actually, that we actually find ourselves in who God designed us to be. And I want to talk to you about a, a trip, actually. I was a, I was a part of a trip. Uh, Eleven of us from East Coast here went to, we went over to Israel about 10 days ago. We got back, and we spent 10 or 11 days um, kind of prepa- on, you know, nine days in the country, but we were preparing before that and to go. And so we were in, I think we have some pictures. There's, there's the Temple Mount, actually. We got to spend some time in Jerusalem while we were there. But when I came back, Pastor Matt actually asked me to share uh, a little bit about my trip and about what kind of came alive, because the Bible will come alive. You know, this is like real stories of real, real locations around the world. Like, this is not just like, hey, um, some book fictitiously that was written somewhere, that this is actually real stories, that Jesus really walked the planet, really walked in an area that there's all sorts of incredible Old Testament stories that we read in the, the front of our Bibles that we actually got to visit some of the, the, the locations of where the, the 12 tribes of Israel were kind of dispersed across the land. We got, to, we got to see the Temple Mount where this is actually the location where they believe that you know, Isaac was bound, that Abraham took Isaac up the mountain, bound him there as an offering to God, but then God found there was a ram in the thicket. If you know the Old Testament story that God provided a ram for the sacrifice, this Temple Mount is where that, and there have been battles for years and years and years. If you're familiar with Israel, you're familiar with all that, that God's plan is for that space, it will come to life. We, went, we were there, we walked, the, we walked the streets, we got to actually stand on a mountain. I think there's a picture of my wife actually in a mustard field. You know, Jesus talks about mustard seed faith. Well, we got to stand and read the Beatitudes, the blessed are the 
poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are, if you know that um, passage from Matthew, we stood in a, in a that's mustard um, growing up about this high. We sat, I think there might be one more picture, we sat on this mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee where Jesus would have taught the Beatitudes. I'm not telling you all this to brag and go, hey, I got to do this, and you didn't. That's not what this is about. This is actually about me going, hey, you know what, this is real stuff, and some real things can happen there. I want to I want to share a, a passage of scripture that really did come to life for me. Really, as I walked and we, we did life in Israel for nine days, there's a, there's a story, you might know this, it's the Good Samaritan story. You know, the Good Samaritan story from scripture transcends Christianity. It's not just a Christian story that we talk about in the church, right? This is something that actually laws have been built off of in our community that if you'll stop and help somebody in good faith, that you know you can't be sued and because you're actually you know acting in good faith to help somebody, help your neighbor, help somebody in situations. But let me read this story to you, and I want to tell you a little bit about why it came to life for me. But Luke 10, 30 through 37 from the New American Standard says this. As Jesus replied and said, a man, a Jewish man, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he encountered robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. Somebody say, felt compassion. And came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed compassion on him. Then Jesus said, Go and do the same. You know, there's a few things from this story that, that are interesting to me. When I read my Bible, I, I, I hope that when you read your Bible, you try to like kind of get into the space a little bit and you go, what did that really look like? You know, I think about a story where somebody is left half dead on the side of the road and a priest, which maybe would re be representative maybe of me as pastor or somebody who's a, you know, a leader in, in ministry today it would be culturally kind of the reference. And I walk by and I, and I see somebody bloodied and beaten would you ever read your Bible and think, where were the robbers? Where did they go? Could it be that they were lurking or that maybe even I might be attacked next? Y'all ever think this? Like you drive down the road, you see somebody on the side of the road in your real context, and rather than helping, you're like, man, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Y'all ever thought that? Come on, raise your hand. All of us have thought that probably. You've probably thought, man, should I help somebody? Should I not help somebody? What should I do? It's just easier to keep on going, right? It doesn't have to be in your car. It doesn't have to be on the side of the road. It doesn't have to be late at night. It could be anywhere, in any situation. You, you have those feelings about, what about me? What if I jump in? Well, the, you know, ceremoniously, if, ceremoniously, that's the word, a priest in the, in the Jewish faith, if he were to go get blood on his hands, he would be unclean. It was a no-no for a priest to get blood on them. They'd have to go through all these washings to be, again, credited to be able to go into the temple. And so I actually have a little bit of compassion because I've, I've actually thought, you know what? I don't know if that's for me. Like somebody bloodied, I don't, I'm, any blood, you know, if you're like blood, whoa, I'm out, right? That happens. Some people are that way, right? So I have a little bit of like grace for that. How about the Levite? The Levite would be the equivalent of like a, a church leader, maybe a small group leader, maybe a church attender, a regular attender, somebody who knew the stuff, right? Some of you guys would fit into that category. Many of you probably would fit into that category. And you'd be like, man, I'm in a hurry, man, I'm, you know, it, somebody else will do it. Y'all ever thought of that? Come on, we all thought that before. Somebody else would take care of it. Why me? Like, come on. Like, I'm in a hurry. I got to be somewhere. That could happen. But then the Samaritan, who was different than the Jew, a big deal in that culture that the Samaritan and the Jews, they, they just weren't all that friendly. There, there's all the, all the issues with the Samaritans compared to a Jew that, you know, but the Samaritan crossed the road. The Samaritan went into that, into this space and said, hey, I'm going to be moved with compassion. I'm going to do something about it. You know, in our culture today, over the last few years, even more than maybe ever we've been able to see it, I don't, it's probably been there forever, but we see it more now. There's a lot of groups. There's just like there's Samaritan and there's Jew of the story. There's six foot eight and five foot four. Come on. That's my wife, by the way, five foot four. But there's, there's white and there's black. There's right-handed and there's left-handed. There's blue eyes and there's green eyes. There's all the differences. There's economically like up here and there's economically down here. There's politically left side, there's politically right side. There's always an in-group and an out-group. So many of them. A friend of ours, a friend of this ministry, uh, Miles McPherson, actually wrote a book called The Third Option. It's a really good book. It's very interesting, very, you know, 
dynamic actually to explain that there's always a third option. And I think that the third option is what Jesus was actually speaking to here was to go, hey, let's go to the other side, regardless of your story, regardless of what group you're in, let's bridge the gap. Let's step across. And I think that if anything Jesus did in the earth, that was his heart, was that he came to save all. Somebody say all. There was no, there's, you know, it's not, it's not Jew, it's not Gentile, it's not male, it's not female. He came to equip and make you worthy, every one of us created in his image, to know and to understand the goodness of a God that we serve. I'm thankful for that Jesus that we serve. I'm thankful that he gave us a picture to say, it doesn't matter if you're the priest, you're the Levite, or you're the Samaritan. It doesn't matter your story. Let's be moved with compassion, and let's do something honorable and worthy of loving somebody regardless of their story. That's why I'm thankful for this team going into the jail. It doesn't matter somebody's story. They're going to go in there, and they're going to preach Jesus. They're going to tell somebody about Jesus. It's Jesus that changes lives. Amen? We could stay back and go, oh, they're criminals. You know what? Many of us would be there or have been there. Come on, somebody. And so we bridge the gap and we go and we just say yes to God, to go and to do the stuff. I'm thankful for that. You know, as I researched for this message, I, 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 I Google things and I'm like, let's look up Good Samaritan. Let's see some, I actually looked at some commentaries and what people say about this story. And I recognize that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. actually used uh, this Good Samaritan story a little bit based on his experience in Israel. He shared a story, this is in, in 1968, so in April of 1968, in a speech, I'm going to read you part of his speech. He was referencing a trip that he was on with his wife to Israel. He said this um, in 1968, he said, but I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this as a setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 miles, or rather 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you're about 2,200 feet below sea level. Difference of 3,400 feet. That's a big difference. He said, that's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as, quote, the bloody pass. As you know, it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over the man on the ground and wondered, where are the robbers and are they still around? Or is it possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking and he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, lure them over there for quick and easy seizure? And so the first question the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? I wonder what would happen to us if we lived a life that said, if not about me, but what about him? Doesn't matter who's in your out group or who's in your in group. Rather than me wondering what would happen to me, what would happen to them if I don't stop? If I don't love them, if I don't care for them, if I don't step in? If I run instead of stepping in, what would happen to them if I don't step in. It challenges me. My Bible challenges me. My Bible, when I read a story, I read it from my perspective a lot. You see, when I went to Israel, I thought Israel was this massive expanse of space. We read the stories in the Bible like it's all over the place. The Sea of Galilee, where most of Jesus' ministry was done, most of his ministry was done within about two and a half miles. That's not very far. From here in Merritt Island, it would be like going to maybe... I don't even know, maybe across the, you know, into Cocoa Village or something from here. If you're over in Vieira and you're watching this, maybe it'd be like going, you know, maybe to the Avenues shopping center from the high school where you're watching this. Two and a half miles, a lot of ministry, a lot of things got done in a small space. And so often I think that the bigness of my Bible doesn't necessarily refer to the smallness of me and my story. But I think God wants to show you some things in each one of the stories. You know, I, I, I questioned many times. Why, why, why is somebody worthy? We've talked about this many times in, in the church of somebody becomes worthy based on what something is willing to be paid for that life, right? Your life or my life, we often would say is worthy because Jesus laid down his whole life for your life. You go in and you buy something in a store, it's as valuable as somebody's willing to pay for it, right? Well, I wondered about the Good Samaritan story and I think about the person broken down on the side over here, the Jewish man who was left half dead. What made him worthy? Jesus hadn't even died yet, so we can't say it was because Jesus died for him. You know why he was worthy? Because God created him. Come on. 
Before you know Jesus, you were worthy. Before you had relationship with God Almighty, you're worthy because God created you in his image. Psalm 139 says this, you made all, the, all my delicate parts, the inner parts of my body, and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. I'm thankful that we live in a complex culture, even though it can get messy sometimes, because the differences make us better. Come on. That's real. Y'all believe that, right? The differences can make us better? Okay. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. It is interesting that we can find ourselves in this scripture. At the same time, we can find him who created us in this scripture. We find out so much about who we are, but we got to dig a little bit. We got to ask some questions as we read. You know, the, the Good Samaritan parable was actually told in response to Jesus being questioned. If we look back right in front of that passage of scripture, I want to read that to you. He was being asked a question. Jesus was that he was asked probably 10 times in the New Testament. We see him being asked. And here's the question. It says, verse 25. It says, behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's the question he's been asked so many times. People want to know that. What do I need to do? Every one of us in this room probably has asked a question like that before. What do I need to do to have eternal life? Because I want to live in heaven one day. I don't want to go to hell or something. I want, to, I want to inherit eternal life. Verse 26, and he said to him, what is, what is written in the law? He asked him a question. How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, anybody ever wanted to justify yourself? Come on, it's too far across the road. They're, they're too bloodied, or they're too messy, or they're too poor, or they're too rich. We always want to justify ourselves, sadly. It started in the garden. You remember Adam and Eve? He, she made me eat the, right? It's always, we, it's easy to step back with somebody else, but we got to own it. It says, but wanting to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And then Jesus went into the story about the good spirit and who the neighbor was. The neighbor was the one who actually did it. You know, Nike, just do it, right? Just do it. If I could give you a message for today, I would tell you this, just do it and you'll truly live. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, do this and you will live. What is the this? The this was love God and love people. You know, we read our Bible through the lens of for me, for me, for me. But what if we read our Bible for them, for her, or for him, or for that person who might be different than me, who might look across and go, ah, I don't know. Could you learn something from that somebody? Come on. We could. You know, Easter's coming. We celebrate two weeks from this weekend. We celebrate Jesus is alive. He died on a cross for us, but he went into a grave and he came out three days later. And we get to celebrate he is alive and living on the inside of you and me by the Spirit of God. Come on, that's an incredible celebration. We get to do that in two weeks. But you know what? That wasn't done just for you and for me. That was done for the whole world to know about it. We have invite cards. We're going to give you invite cards in all of our locations as you leave. And I would just encourage you, you know what, would you pray this week? Would you say, hey, who, who could I give this to? Who could I invite? And not just go, hey, here's an invite for you, but actually, hey, I'll save you a seat. Come and do it with me. Even if they look a little different or sound a little different or act a little different. Come on, I love that we are a church that you could belong here before you believe everything or even behave perfectly. Come on. We want to be a big front door. Come on, let's invite people in. Let's let somebody come in and, and learn and grow and understand what they don't yet understand. And you know what? God will be faithful to complete the good work that he began in each one of our lives. But let's be willing to actually do it. Just do it. That's hard sometimes because it makes me uncomfortable. Anybody ever get uncomfortable? Come on. If we're real, we all get uncomfortable by something or someone. I sat on an airplane for 11 and a half hours. That was uncomfortable. <laughs> 13 and a half coming back the other way. It was uncomfortable. But you know what? Some things came alive in me. This series, Seek and Find, has been uncomfortable. Why? Because when I read my Bible, it comes alive and it challenges me. You know, over the last six or eight weeks while we've been in this series, I've been reading my Bible and I've been reading some stories. And I read a story in 1 Kings chapter 17. It, um, it challenged me. There's a story of Elijah, he was an Old Testament prophet, and, and there was a famine, and like, there was no rain, and like, it was coming, and God told Elijah, hey, go down by this brook, 
and the brook will flow, you'll have water, and I'll provide food for you. There'll be ravens that'll come, and I'll provide food for you. Maybe you know this story. If not, I would challenge you. Read 1 Kings 17. But he goes down by the brook, and after a while, the brook dries up. And he's like, what do we do now, God? And God says, don't worry. Go to this widow over here, the widow of Zarephath. Go to this widow. She'll provide for you. That would be challenging for me to go, hey, you know what? I'm going to go to the person in that culture, a widow in that culture, didn't have a whole lot. They were left to be provided for by somebody else. But the widow actually, when he gets there, only has a little bit left. Has like barely enough to feed her son. She and her son. And the prophet says, make me some bread. That's hard. That challenges me. I don't know that I want to go ask somebody to do the hardest thing that they could ever do for my sake and for me. I don't know that that's what God would ask you or me to do. But he asked the prophet to go in to do that. And what did she do? She said, okay, I'll do it. Willingly, she baked her last bit of bread or cake. Come on, any cake people in the house? Come on, cake. I like cake. We'll call it cake. Baked him a cake, provided for him. But you know what scripture says? That that, there was enough to provide for her for many days after that. Although it was her last meal, she was going to cook her last meal for the prophet. This is, this is a little bit crazy. It's a crazy story. But what, what does it do in me? You know what? It's not hard for me to give my first. This is not about money. This is just me being real, talking to you about what God speaks to me. It's not hard for me to give my first, but if God asked me to give my last, and we're not talking last French fry. Come on, somebody. Sometimes my wife's like, can I get one of those? I'm like, oh, it's my last. We're talking about your last meal. This was like the last meal. That's a scary thing to say yes to. But you know what? When she did, God provided many days for her. When she had one day left, God provided many days when she gave her last even to him. This is not about money. You can relax. I'm not going to talk to you about money for a second. It's not about money. But it challenges me. Would I be willing to just do it when God says do it? Yes, Lord, I, I'm willing. I read my Bible and I read a story about another widow in the New Testament who gave the best offering. She gave two mites. Jesus noticed it, gave an incredible offering, more than any other, the scripture says, out of sacrifice and obedience. She just said yes to God. Wow, there's a boy who gave his lunch to feed thousands. He got to participate in a miracle of feeding thousands of people. Come on, by just saying yes, I'm in God, I'll do it. Think about a team that we prayed for that's going to go into a jail, that's going to go minister to hundreds of people over the next however many years. We're able to do this on a weekly basis. They get to participate in seeing lives forever changed. People over here serving in our children's ministry and all of our campus, people pouring into kids that are literally encouraging the next generation of the gospel to just come on. You can do this. You can make it with Jesus. Doesn't matter all the craziness and all the chaos in our culture. You can make it. There's people that are greeting you as you come in every week, and there's people serving in so many different places just saying yes to God. And I would challenge you, don't say yes to me because you heard a message preached. I would say, God, what would you have me do? I just want to do that. Love you, God, and love people well. How could I do it, and where might that be? What might that look like? There is grace to do it. Just be obedient. In the obedience, the simple obedience, there's grace for it. Let me tell you why this story mattered so much to me. I was in Israel. We were traveling from Jerusalem, I think we have a picture, from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea, actually, which if you look at this picture, you see here that the Dead Sea is at the bottom, and Jericho is right down there by it. We're traveling from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea. We did float in the Dead Sea. Come on, that was cool. Except the water was like 62 degrees. Burr. Burr. But we did it. But we were traveling from Jerusalem, which is at altitude there, 2,540 feet, going down to Jericho, which would have been 800 feet below sea level. And we went down to the Dead Sea, which was 2,000 feet below sea level. Incredible time we had. But on our trip, we're doing the windy road thing. We're going over the hills. And we come over a hill at about 60 miles an hour in a mini bus. So there's 15 of us or 13 of us in this bus. And there's a car dead stopped in the road, like in our lane and right in front of us. Whoosh, to the fast lane whoosh back around and we hit the brakes and I'm like what are we doing why are we stopping our driver was a Muslim Israeli Muslim our tour guide was an Israeli Jew not messianic didn't did no relationship with Jesus knows the scriptures well no relationship yet with Jesus and 11 of us on our team we stop on the side of the road we're probably a hundred yards or so from the car that was in the middle of the road back there 
the Muslim driver throws it in reverse and backs up. And I'm like, what are we doing, you know? Because we're on our way somewhere, right? And the Jewish tour guide says, you know the story of the Good Samaritan? We're on that road. We're headed from Jerusalem to Jericho. We're going to be the Good Samaritan. We back up. He backs it up actually into the, into the fast lane back behind the car, stops the minibus there. So if somebody's going to get plowed, it's not going to be the, the dude in the car stalled in the road. We're going to be those people. We hop out. We push the car out of the way. He says, I'm good. I got somebody coming to help me. We hop back in and we carry on. And it could have just been a time where, hey, we got to do something cool. Or it could have been a time where I look at my Bible and I go, I got to participate in the story that Jesus is talking about of helping somebody, loving somebody. I don't know the person. He was a total stranger to me. But yet, who is our neighbor? That was the question that was asked. Who's our neighbor? You know who our neighbor is? All of humanity. That's who our neighbor is. That's who your neighbor is. That's who my neighbor is. Yeah, I live, I live at an address, 4480. There's somebody at 4440 and there's somebody over here. But you know what? Those are not my only neighbors. My neighbor is a, is a community around me, a people that I could say yes to and I can love and I can care for. I would challenge you, if the Muslim driver knew the Good Samaritan story and pulled over, how much more so we as believers, as followers of Christ, who know that we've been paid for, bought with a price, the blood of Jesus was enough, that we could actually cross every divide. Come on. We could go wherever we need to go. We could do whatever we need to do by the grace of God to go love somebody and care for somebody. Does he need Jesus? Yes, he needs Jesus. Just do it. I like it, my friend. James 1.25 says, But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not forgetful here, but a doer. Somebody say doer. Doer of the work. This is the one who will be blessed in what he does. John, John 13 says, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Let's go do it. Let's go love some people. Romans 1.16, for now I'm not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Somebody say everyone. The whole world, everyone who believes. The Jew first and then the Gentile. It's not Jew only, it's not Gentile only. It is all of us, everywhere in between. And guess who gets to bridge the gap? Jesus did it once for all of us. But now we got him living on the inside of us by the Spirit of God. Let's go bridge the gap. Let's go stand the gap. Let's go love some people. Let's get busy. Let's go do it. Just go do it. Do it. You know what I like to say a lot? Let's go. Let's go do it. I don't want to just get real fed and, man, I get filled up in my word. This is good stuff. You should get filled up. But you know what? If you're not, if you're not careful, you'll end up like the Dead Sea with all the minerals. We'll all be floating around, kicking around, having a great time. And the world out there is dying. They need Jesus. They need you. They need me to invite them in. Somebody invited me to this church 20 years ago while I was just at work. I didn't know about East Coast Christian. I had no idea what this church was. I had no idea that you could actually come here and belong here before you believed and behaved. I didn't know that. I had a relationship with Jesus, but I needed a church family. You know the, the picture of the good Samaritan saying, hey, I'm going to go put you in the inn. I'm going to take care of you. You know what I think that picture of that inn really is? It's a local church. You can get fixed. You can get healed up. You can get taken care of. It's a local church. I need my local church. You need your local church. Your neighbor needs your local church. There's a lot of great churches. I think this one's pretty stinking good. Come on, somebody. But they need some church. I'm a church guy. You're a church people. You're here today. But there's a lot of people. We're going to put invites in your hands. Invite somebody to come hear the good news that Jesus came out of a grave for them. He died on a cross for them. But let's not stop there. You know what? You don't even have to wait till Easter. Come on. You can invite them to come next weekend and the next weekend and the next weekend all summer long. I'm going to pray before we go home. Would you bow your heads across all of our locations? If you'd bow your heads, just close your eyes. We are going to have some time of worship. We're going to have some time to reflect. We're going to have some time. But right now in this moment, I want you to know that you're worthy. You're created with a purpose. And that was to know God. And that was to be used by God. If you don't have a relationship with the God of the universe, he sent his best for you. His only. His only son to die for you and to die for me, that we could have relationships so that we could actually have relationship with God and we could truly live and go love our neighbor and do it well. If you're here today in any of our locations and you don't have a relationship with God Almighty through the person of Jesus, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. We're going to do it as a family across all of our locations, even now. 
If you just repeat this prayer, just simply you're talking to God. Say this, say, Father God, thanks for sending Jesus to die for me and my sin, all my shame, all my failures. Thank you for purpose. Thank you for value. Thank you for your love. I receive you today as my Savior, as the Lord of my life, from this day forward, in Jesus' name. Could you say amen? Just while you're sitting right where you're at, if you prayed that for the first time, if you gave your heart to Christ in any of our locations, maybe you're watching online, you got this on a podcast somewhere, we want to celebrate with you. If you're in one of our physical locations, if you would raise your hand and say, hey, I did that today, we'd love to celebrate with you. You can do that right now on the count of three, if you would. One, two, three. Would you just raise your hand and say, hey, I did that. I prayed that prayer. Come on, I'll see you, sir, back there. Praise God. We have a gift we want to give you in all of our locations. If you're watching online, I think they'll put something up. You can text Jesus to a number. Tell somebody in the chat. God bless you guys. I'm going to hand it over to the host pastors now. Let's go do this. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. Amen. What a holy thing. Can we just celebrate people getting saved all around the world right now after hearing that message? Hallelujah. What an incredible thing that is. It says that just when one gets saved and receives Jesus in their heart, that all of heaven rejoices for that. And we should celebrate that too. In fact, if you're one of those that just gave your life to Christ, don't celebrate that alone. We want to do that with you. We want to be able, for one, to resource you and help you. What does a life with Jesus look like and mean? But wow, do we just want to celebrate and congratulate you on really taking a step and learning what it is to live for Jesus and have him as the Lord of your life. It's an amazing thing. Please give us the opportunity by just texting right now this number or hitting that link so that we could reach out and be able to communicate with you.